Well, hello. Welcome again to our Bible study. We continue our study of the book of Exodus. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're once again so grateful for your mercy, for that is our theme for today. And we ask you to be with us, be kind and be merciful to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, our lesson is the continuing study of the book of Exodus, and we've kind of left Moses in a predicament. He's out here in the wilderness. He's been up and down the mountain to try to get some direction from God about the future of Israel and where they're supposed to go. Well, it seems like on one of Moses' trips all the way up to the mountain, the people are kind of a little bit naughty at this point. So let me read to you our lesson for today. So the people saw that Moses, he was up in the mountain for a very long time, and he wasn't coming down from the mountain. So they gathered around Aaron, and they said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons, your daughters are wearing. Bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings. They brought them to Aaron. He took what was handed to him, and he made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And he said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And so where Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented uh, fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down, they ate, they drank, and they got up and indulged in revelry. Oh, isn't that nice? That's the start of our lesson. We're going to read the next part in a minute. But I want to start with this because whoop, we have the wrong idea about the Jews. We think that the Jews were mono theistic. Uh, that means one God. They worship one God. They believe, they believe that there's only one God. That's actually not entirely true. Uh, at the beginning of the nation of Israel, in fact, we sometimes even wonder looking at Abraham, whether even Abraham understood that there was only one God. That when Abraham believed there were multiple gods, but this God that was revealed to him was the one powerful God that oversaw all gods. We don't know, because it seems, uh, it seems like the Jews up until this time were not monotheistic. All right? The first monotheists were, are you ready? The Persians. Oops, Persians. Oh my goodness. Maybe I should rewrite that. I'm getting ahead of myself. So again, let's try it. Drum roll, please. The Persians. Okay, who are the Persians? Oh, maybe you've watched Gerard Butler in the 300, that movie. <laughs> you know, the 300, of course, Gerard Butler uh, and the Spartans were the heroes. But if you're a Jew, I'll be frank with you, the Persians are the heroes because the Persians are the people who helped deliver the people of Israel from freedom from the Babylonian captivity. So they're kind of the good guys. They're also the first monotheists. The Persians to this day are monotheists. Do you know the name of their religion? Hmm. Let's see if you, you can guess. Starts with a Z and you're like, I've never heard of this. Zoroastrian. They are Zoroastrians. You're like, I've never heard of that religion. You probably don't know many Persians. Because the Persians are still monotheistic and still are Zoroastrians. And if you knew something about the Zoroastrian religion, you say, boy, there's a lot that sounds very similar to Christianity in it. It's kind of true. It's, it's an amazing religion. You should take a look at it. We know of somebody who is a Zoroastrian. Are you ready for this? His name was Freddy. Got it yet? Freddie Mercury! Yeah! We are the champions, my friend. There you go. Freddie Mercury was a Zoroastrian. He was a Persian. The Persians live in Iran. The 
contemporary residents of Iran are Arab invaders who are now known as the Muslim invaders in, in Iran. They are controlling the culture in the country of Iran, but the original inhabitants of Iran were the Persians. They are actually an oppressed minority in Iran today. But they are still Zoroastrians, and they are still monotheistic. Many Zoroastrians, many of the Persians, have moved to England because there was a relationship between England and Iran, and so many of the Persians, Zoroastrians, to avoid the oppression in Iran, escaped to England. So you see a lot of people like Freddie Mercury, a lot of the Persians who settled in Iran. Are in England. So there you go. So the Jews were not originally monotheistic. It's a view that they came to over time. God kept revealing himself to them until they came to this understanding. But at this point, it's very clear that they don't believe that there's one God. Uh, they get very impatient. So they ask Aaron, please make us gods so that we can worship them. They have such short memories, don't they? And we, we can be so judgmental of them, but you need to see yourself in the Jews. Oh. You need to see yourself in the Jews. Because this story is a very contemporary story. I'm going to tell you, here's the story of my life. Oh, great is our God. Oh, God is so good. My life is just swimmingly. Oh, I stubbed my toe. How could God, God do this to me? I can't believe I stumbled. No, on this day that I really need to walk around, I had so many things to do. How could God do this to me? See, this is the way we act. You are no different. I am no different than the Jews. This is a very funny story because it's the continual story of the Old Testament. Oh, God has blessed him. Oh, God, we will never serve any other gods. The next day, something bad happens. I can't believe God would do this to me. This is us. We're so fickle. We're so impatient. And so they reflect our attitudes. Again, this theme that we see in the Old Testament. Now, they were making gods, graven images, little g, little gods. Remember how we said last week that the name for God is a generic name that oversees all of these Semitic languages, the Canaanites, the Jews, everybody else. They called God by this name El. Okay? They're gods. Or, <laughs> it says gods, plural. Ooh, I might blow your mind with this one. The plural name is Elohim. So wait a minute. We call God Elohim. Well, that's actually plural. Gods with an S on it. Elohim is plural. So... They made gods for themselves. They made Elohim for themselves, okay? Um, now, we seem to think that the ancient peoples were absolutely stupid. They actually believed that the gods resided in these graven images. No, they didn't. They were not stupid. See, that's an imposition of our 20, 20 to 21st century mind that we think, Oh, these people are so stupid, they made graven images for themselves. Hey, <laughs> I wish I had my wallet on me. We make graven images for ourselves, too. It's called money, right? Dollar bills. The truth is, the power of money doesn't really reside in that dollar bill. It's the promise that our government puts behind it. And people in the future are going to look back 1,000 years, 2,000 years. Those people are so stupid putting trust in money. Well, it's the same type of thing, okay? They understood that these were just representations. They are not stupid, okay? But they did believe that there were other gods. And so they wanted to represent those gods in some way because God had not performed as they had expected. So they wanted to move their loyalty to somebody else. It's kind of like being a Pittsburgh Pirate fan. At some point, you get tired of the losing seasons. I'm going to root for somebody else. Actually, I've kind of given up on baseball at this point. It gets very tiring. But, you know, you give up on your home team, and so you move to somebody else. This God isn't going to move. We've been waiting here forever. So they make a calf. Oh, now a calf is something that the Canaanites would make. 
A calf or a bull, that would be another one. So calves and bulls, and it represented this religion of the Canaanites. Because after all, who were the Jews? The Jews are Canaanites. Okay? They're Canaanites. They are genetically Canaanites. They are socially Canaanites. They're, uh, according to their, um, they're communally Canaanites. They, they are culturally Canaanites. In every which way you can come up with Canaanites, they were Canaanites. And so I know it sounds a bit confusing because the Bible in the Old Testament is always critical of the Canaanites. Don't be like the Canaanites. Don't be like the Canaanites. Well, this is the part of themselves that they hated. It came to represent that uh, religion that worshipped all these other gods except for their god. Remember their god's name? We don't pronounce that out of respect to the Jews because this is a name that they would not even pronounce. So, Canaanites became representative of everything that was evil. Even though the Jews were Canaanites, but at some point, just a little bit of history, what happened is, is so all these Canaanites were running around, the Jews, the Canaanites themselves, the people that called themselves Canaanites, they were all Canaanites. In fact, they exist to this very day. But in that day, the zenith of Canaanite history came when this Jewish leader united all the Canaanite tribes as one people. You remember his name? David. Okay, David united all the Canaanite tribes together as one so they could stand up against the onslaught. Everybody who wanted to take over this, this little territory of, uh, of Canaan, okay, this country, this area. Um, so this was the zenith of her history, David and Solomon. It didn't last very long before they finally fell apart again, but at least there was an attempt, the zenith of Canaanite history. But by then they called themselves the Jews. And the word Canaanite came to represent everything that they despised about their non-monotheistic religion. So by this time, by the time of David, they finally came to a monotheistic belief. But that's in their future. So let's go back. Here, we've got a problem. Because in our lesson for today, this guy, Aaron, you remember him? Aaron, what the heck? He's a brother of Moses, older big, big brother. He's the guy that spoke on behalf of Moses to Pharaoh. He's got no spine, the coward. He becomes complicit in the making of these idols, these gods. He says, Here, here's your gods that brought you out. He announced the festival to the Lord where they would now go and fest, that's what we read in the Bible here, about the big festival that they celebrated. Now, that word Lord, Adonai, that's what that, it's a Hebrew word. You've heard that word maybe, if you have any, uh, maybe you've heard that Adonai, sometimes some of our Christian songs sing that. That's the word when the Jews saw this word, they would say this. They would never, as I mentioned to you, pronounce this word. They would see that and say Adonai. Adonai is generic for Lord or Master. Uh, it was something that was used of an earthly master. It was also something that was used of God. So El, Elohim, Adonai, these were generic names that they used for God or for gods. Now, we're into this part of the lesson. Something's going to happen. Shoes ready to drop. Oh boy, are you ready for this? Let me go on. Verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, Go down, Moses. Remember that song, Go Down, Moses. Maybe not. I'm not going to sing it. Go down, Moses, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. Oh, like that's news, right? That's my addition. But seriously, this is... We knew this about them because the most predictable people in the Bible are human beings. 
We keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. We've been doing the same thing over and over again for 5,000 years, for 10,000 years, for 20,000 years. As long as humans have existed and have been on this earth, we have done the exact same stuff to one another and fallen the same exact problems. So big surprise, Moses. <laughs> Verse 8, they have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and made themselves an idol, cast in the shape of a calf. They've bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, whom you brought out of Egypt, who brought you out of Egypt. I've seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. They are stiff-necked. <laughs> we are stiff-necked. Hear yourself in this. You are the stiff-necked person. I am the stiff-necked person. I am the fickle person. I am the impatient person. This is a very contemporary lesson. Leave me alone, God said, so that my anger may burn against them, so that I may destroy them. Then I will make you a great nation. Oh, wait a minute. We just sometimes read over this lesson. Do you hear what God wants to do? Destroy them again. Just like God destroyed almost the entire world at the time of Noah. What? This doesn't seem like the God that we worship. It seems really uncomfortable. If it doesn't make you uncomfortable, it should. It should make you uncomfortable that God would just destroy these people. Hang tight. Story ain't done yet. Okay? Remember, the most predictable characters in the Bible are us humans. We do the same thing over and over again. The most unpredictable character in the entire Bible is God. And we get a glimpse of that right here. Because here's what you would expect. If God, if this God, were like every other God, vengeful, angry, this God would have destroyed the nation of Israel and done exactly what he suggested that he was going to do. Make Moses the new Abraham, basically. But this God is not like every other God. The Bible has to find a way to illustrate this because how do you get your arms around God? How do you communicate who God is? So the Bible personifies God in a way that we can understand, tells a story in a way we can understand. So this is really kind of an exaggeration. I should, God had every right to destroy them. If God, this God, were like every other God, that's exactly what God would have done. You see, the Bible is trying to illustrate this. It's taking a transcendent God that we can't even comprehend or understand and trying to communicate in a fashion that we do. This is what this God should do. And so these words are being placed in the mouth of God. I should go down and just destroy them. Because that's what every other God would do. But that's not what this God ultimately does. Seems like God is really fickle, but God is not. Remember, this, I think, is kind of a poetic license to try to illustrate who this God truly is. Sometimes it's overstated, just so it bangs in our heads, so it becomes very clear. It, it becomes this object lesson for us. Because remember, we can't understand God. God is too big for us. So we personify God. So go on. Oh. Moses, verse 11, sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people when you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should you, the Egyptians, say it was with evil intent they brought them out to kill them? in the mountain, to wipe them off the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce anger, relent 
do not bring disaster to people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, whom you swore by your own self. I will make a descendant of them as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all the land that I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Moses is kind of appealing to God's ego. God, you wouldn't want people to think badly of you, would you? Oh my goodness, no. Now we don't get the ending of this story. God does rain a bit of vengeance upon the people, but in the end, God does spare them. Because this God, though just, doesn't respond with justice. This God, though concerned about the law, doesn't respond with the law. How does this God respond? This God responds, we talked about this, with mercy. Now the way it's presented in the Bible, it seems like God listens to Moses and responds with mercy. Well, that's kind of a silly thing. But it does show us that we should have boldness when we approach God. When we see something that is unjust, we say, God, why does this happen? Why? God, are pe why are people suffering in this world? Well, maybe they're suffering and they're hungry because I've given you everything that you need and you need to feed them. Sometimes that might be the response that we get back from God. Maybe it's not God that's unjust. Maybe it's us. And I think that's kind of the way this lesson is trying to deal with it. Yes, Moses appeals to God's ego, but ultimately God has mercy. And so this story is told in a way into which we can relate and understand that this God is not like the gods of the other nations, but this God's primary characteristic is mercy. This God is unpredictable because that's not what God should do. God should rain out vengeance upon people. And yes, there is some of that in this God. But in the end, this God is ultimately known by this, mercy. So what is the point of today's lesson? Well, like I said, we don't get the whole story today. We can't just, sometimes when we excerpt these lessons, we miss the broader point of the story. So we have to connect this to the broader point of the book of Exodus. We, you and me, are like the Jews. We are the Jews. We are weak. We are frail. We fall away. We are impatient. We are fickle. We can be praising God one moment. We stub our toe. We're cursing God the next. But God is not a God of law. Okay, God is a God of law. God is not a God of justice. Okay, God is a God of justice. But God chooses not to live by law and by justice. God is, God is the one who's fickle. Well, maybe not fickle. God is the one who's so unpredictable. This is the way God should respond. With law and justice, God responds with mercy. We've been unfaithful. We have been unkind to each other. Do you need to look very far for that today? You've been unkind to people. You know, one of the things that kills me more than anything else is I'll put on there something about how we should be kind to one another and, and all this. And some of the most unkind people who post some of the most unkind things on social media, and they're Christians. Yes, we should be kinder to each other. No, what they really mean is those people should be kinder, but I have a right to treat you with such unkindness. Stop looking at how other people treat you. Look at yourself. Look at what you're posting. Look at what you say about other people. Okay? We have been unfaithful. We have been unkind. We've been known by our hate rather than our love. And yet, guess what God does? God doesn't hold justice and law over top of our heads. God is merciful. <laughs> so I think this lesson is a call for us to change the way we think about one another and our relationship with God. If we got what we deserved, 
like all the other gods of all the other nations, we'd receive law and justice, and you and I would be all going to hell. Okay? It is arrogant for us to think that we are somehow better than those other people. Because we're not. We are all like the Jews. Fickle. Stubborn. Stiff-necked. We are quite predictable because we're humans. But God is so unpredictable that even though God could rightly hold justice and mercy over top of our, our justice and law over top of our heads, God has mercy. <laughs> Let's pray. Wow, God. Despite our unkindness, our impatience, our injustice, our mistreatment of one another. You respond in such a ridiculously unpredictable manner. Mercy. That kind of ticks off people who are about law and about justice. But boy, isn't it grand. Because we are on the receiving end of that. So God, help us to be more kind, more merciful to those around us, especially those whom we do not understand. Because that's how your mercy is made known in this world. That's what's going to transform our country in this world. Not law, not justice, but your mercy. Because no other God is known by this, only you. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. May God's blessing be upon you. May God bless you and keep you now and forever and send you forth in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Be merciful and be kind in God's name.